So I have here one of my favorite types of uh, glassware, the Erlenmeyer flask. And in this Erlenmeyer flask, I've added uh, about 100 milliliters of water. And I've also added a chemical called phenolphthalein. Um, I've added about five drops of phenolphthalein. And it's a chemical that when it reacts with the base, it will uh, cause a chemical reaction that, that results in a changing of color. So I'm gonna add a base here. Ammonia is the base that I'm gonna use today. And you probably have smelt ammonia before. Uh, it's in uh, household cleaners. You can use it as a cleaning product. Um, it has a pretty strong, pungent smell to it. Um, so I'm gonna add ammonia to the Erlenmeyer flask that has distilled water and uh, phenolphthalein to it. And you should be able to immediately see the reaction that takes place. We get a really vibrant pink color and if I'll give this little swirl, you can see it changes pretty instantly, uh, that chemical reaction taking place. And um, a base reacting with the phenolphthalein causes that change in color. And so today in our surface area to volume lab, we're gonna use this as a way to be able to cause our model cell to uh, change colors and we can use that as a way to measure diffusion. So to make our model cell today, we're gonna to use a compound called agarose. And agarose is um, uh, in a powder form. Um, it's actually made from, of one thing, uh, seaweed. And uh, when you add it to distilled water, uh, it creates kind of a cloudy mixture like so. And I'm gonna put this into the microwave and, uh, and heat it up for uh, a couple minutes until all of the agarose dissolves. And when it's dissolved, it will look like water. Uh, it should look like water. Uh, it, it gets hot and it will boil and you have to make sure it doesn't boil over. But it will dissolve all of the agarose. And then once all of the agarose is dissolved, I'll be able to add phenolphthalein to the agarose liquid. And I'll pour this into a container uh, to allow it to cool. And once it's cooled, it forms kind of like a jello-y type substance uh, that we'll be able to cut into cubes to make some model cells. So I always want to use a glove because this is super hot, uh, safety first here. Um, so I'm just going to give this a good little swirl and we can start to see that it's kind of starting to dissolve and I'll put it back in probably for a shorter time period. Uh, we'll go about a minute at a time now so it doesn't boil over. So here you can see we're getting pretty close. Um, it looks pretty clear and basically just like water. I'm gonna give it just a few more seconds and then we'll go ahead and add our phenolphthalein. So I've got uh, my agarose diffused or uh, melted here now. Um, and it looks pretty good. It's uh, all clear. And so very carefully I'm going to add my phenol failing, which is in this graduated cylinder. And I'm gonna add this to the dissolved agarose. Give it a little swirl. I wanna make sure that I don't do this near my face. Um, let that mix up a little bit. And then this is pretty hot still, so I'm going to let it cool for a couple of minutes and then we'll pour it into a uh, container to allow it uh, to solidify. So now our mixture is uh, pretty cool. Uh, it's still warm, but cool enough to be able to touch and not burn your hand. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and pour this into our container to allow it to be able to solidify. All right, so we've got our agarose that's uh, cooled and is solidified, kind of like jello, and I'm gonna go ahead and take it out of our container and the purpose of this lab is to try to see how does different cell size, um, how does the, the surface area of a cell and the volume of a cell, how does that influence the ability of things to move in and out or to diffuse in and out of the cell. And so what I'm gonna do with this condensed solidified agarose here is cut it 
into two cubes. And um, obviously this is not the same as an actual cell, but it'll allow us to test and um, uh, kind of test some math principles here and get a sense of how, um, how this actually works. So I'm gonna cut this chunk into two cells. I'm gonna do the best I can using a ruler and a butter knife, plastic butter knife. And our first cell, cell A, is gonna be three centimeters cubed. So that means all the way around, uh, it's gonna be approximately three centimeters. And then a smaller cell, cell B, that's one centimeters cubed all the way around. And um, so we'll take these two cells and then we'll place them into our two distinct beakers and add some base, some ammonia, and let them sit and then see what happens. So I'll go ahead and cut these. So here we've got one cube. Uh, it's not the, the most perfect of cubes, but this is our one by one by one cube. And then here we've got our three by three by three. And obviously this is a little easier said than done um, in cutting this uh, so that it's straight all the way across and exactly three by three by three or one by one by one. Um, and that actually, is somewhat intentional as it allows us to really discuss some of the experimental error with this procedure. Um, so I won't get into that further now. Next, I'm going to add 15 drops of ammonia to each of my two beakers here. And I'll move the camera so that you can see. And then we'll soak the cubes for 15 minutes. Give each of these a little swirl. And then go ahead and place our cubes into the correct container. A little easier if I had multiple people to help. Uh, and we'll let these sit for 15 minutes and see what happens. You can see that they're already starting to change color. So now that our cubes have been sitting for 15 minutes, I'm gonna take out those cubes. And what I really wanna do is see how much the pink color as caused by the ammonia, ammonia reacting with the phenol failing, how much is that diffused into my model cell cubes? So I'll take those out, I'll cut it down the middle, and then I'll measure the distance that the pink band has diffused in and show you uh, so that we can measure the distance diffused. So here are my two cubes and I'm gonna go ahead and do my best to cut this in half here. Kind of just open it up like a book and let's see if we can get the camera closer here in just a second there's a distinctive much more so the whole thing is pink but there's a very distinct pink darker line area and that's the portion that we're going to measure and i'll cut the other one in half as well and then zoom in so you can try to see these lines a little bit better All right, so if I take my ruler and in the close-up, you can really see how bad my lines are. <laughs> uh, we'll measure the distance in. I'll do it on this side here. It looks to be the best. And we're gonna measure in millimeters um, so that we have some comparable measurements. And if I look, I can see my the dark pink kind of goes around here, and here, and here. There's a distinctive darker pink section. So that's the portion that I'm gonna measure. I'm gonna see how far that's traveled in. And if I measure right here, I see one, two, three millimeters. 
here I'm seeing one, two, three. So I think it would be safe to say that our three centimeter cubed cell diffused three millimeters. Try to get that in the camera here. And our cell B, and when I look at this, I really don't see well, most of it's pretty dark. Um, so if I measure in one, two, three, four, five millimeters, because in both cases the um, color is diffusing into the cells, the most that because cell B is one centimeter cube, so it's uh, a width of one centimeter, the most that we could have is five millimeters, half of the of one centimeter. And for cell A, the most that we could have would be 1.5 centimeters. So as I measure this, it's pretty uniformly dark all the way across. And so I'm gonna say that this is diffused five millimeters. So what we'll do with this data that we've collected here is I've recorded cell A as Three, uh, three millimeters, and then cell B as a distance of five millimeters. And typically what we would do is each group would, would do the lab and then we would share or pool all of our data. And this year we'll just use past uh, IB students' year, uh, data um, for, from past years and we'll combine it with the data that I just collected and that way we'll have a large sample size and so going back a couple of years we'll have lots and lots of data that we can use and you'll find that linked on the instructions for the assignment and we can use that to procure some uh, averages and draw some better conclusions and so let's see what what difference does this have here um, our cell A being three centimeters cubed and cell B being one centimeters cubed, how do these different cell sizes and their corresponding surface area to volume ratios, how does that impact the ability of materials to diffuse in, in this case, but in real life, both in and out, how does that ratio influence the size that we see of cells?